If you were alive before the rise of the internet and online shopping, you probably have at least one fond memory of shopping in a department store. Me? I was the jerk little kid hiding from their mom in clothing racks and pretending to be a mannequin trying to scare other shoppers. What was a fond memory for me was probably a very annoying day for my mom, now that I think about it. But how did we go from a world of small shops like E.A. O'Neill's as we discussed in our last episode, to large department stores. For many, the story of department stores in Birmingham begins and ends with Jacobson's. But the story doesn't start there. The first department store in Birmingham was started by Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe in the 1890s. This is the story of Gittel and Morris Levinson, who, in addition to creating Birmingham's first department store, we're also the first Jewish family in Birmingham. This is our second episode in a four-part series where we are exploring the evolution of Birmingham's retail environment in partnership with the Birmingham Shopping District. This is Birmingham Uncovered, a podcast by the Birmingham Museum where we are exploring the diverse and compelling lives that built Birmingham, Michigan into the community that it is today. First, Some background on Birmingham. We are a city of approximately 20,000 people over 4.73 square miles, approximately halfway between Detroit and Pontiac and Oakland County. This area was occupied by members of the Three Fires Confederacy of Indigenous Peoples before white settlement in the area started in the late 1810s. Birmingham became a city in 1933 and today is known as a prosperous and multifaceted community with a thriving cultural scene. Both Morris Levinson and Gittel Valhendler Levinson were immigrants from Latvia in the 1880s. They were part of a wave of immigration to the United States of Jews from Eastern Europe, particularly the area around Poland and Russia, which was at its height between the 1880s and 1914. Both in the past and today, people immigrate for similar reasons, It might be for economic opportunity, or they might be displaced due to war, violence, or oppression. And this wave of Eastern European immigration was no different. Even though Latvia had an old Jewish community with its roots going back to the 1500s, in the late 1800s, two things happened that put that community in peril. Firstly, Latvia was under Imperial Russian control. And while Russia had laws that discriminated against Jews, those had been eased up in the middle of the 1800s, and it allowed Jewish folk to live in larger cities, it reversed the heavier tax burdens they were under, and allowed them to get involved in politics. This was at a time when the Russian state was transitioning from a feudal society and was flirting with the idea of constitutional monarchy. And just like in many other countries at this time, Progressives, socialists, and communists were pushing for change, and that sometimes led to violence. Many traditionalists in Russia linked the rise of progressive groups fighting for increased rights and freedoms with the greater freedoms given to Jewish people in Imperial Russia, and they believed that Jews were behind these movements. Secondly, the head of the Imperial Russian state, Tsar Alexander II, was assassinated in 1881. One of the convicted conspirators of the assassination was Jewish, and one was allegedly Jewish, and both opportunists and bigots drummed up the Jewish involvement and made it seem like a Jewish plot. In reality, the assassination was the work of Russian nihilists who were hoping to spark a revolution. The assassination of the Tsar led to harsh new laws hampering Jewish businesses, the rights of Jewish citizens to move freely about, their ability to participate in local or national governments, and their ability to attend schools and universities. It also kicked off a wave of violence called pogroms, targeted anti-Jewish riots that targeted Jewish homes, businesses, and people. In many cases, this violence was supported and encouraged by local officials. This led many Jewish individuals to flee, and many emigrated to the United States. In the decade of the 1880s, 200,000 Jews from Eastern Europe, primarily from Russian-controlled lands, emigrated to the United States. 
In the 1890s, 300,000 would come. Between 1900 and 1914, violence against Jews reached a crescendo with the publication of the book The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, first published in Russia in 1903. And this led to an additional 1.5 million Eastern European Jews emigrating to the United States. The Protocols are a literary forgery that popularized the idea of a shadowy group of world Jewish leaders plotting to take over the world. Even after being proven a forgery in the early 1900s, the Protocols were, and still are, cited by Nazis and anti-Semitic folk the world over. In the United States, this conspiracy theory gained credibility and mass distribution by Henry Ford. Yeah, Henry Ford, the car guy. The Protocols were published first by him in the Dearborn Independent newspaper, which he owned and later in a book called The International Jew, which he helped publish. Who would have thought that the guy who hated jazz music because it was played by black musicians, and who treated his factory workers different based on their racial and ethnic backgrounds, would also be anti-Semitic? Not was forced to learn square dancing in elementary school because Henry Ford hated black people and the music they created me. And... If you are wondering, this is the global elite secretly control the world narrative that every other conspiracy theory about how a small group of people who secretly control the world is based on. Nowadays, many people who push these sorts of conspiracy theories like to downplay the fact that the root of it is hating Jews, but if you dig down a little bit, you'll find it. But back to our story about Gittel and Morris. They were part of that 1880s wave of Eastern European Jewish immigrants. Morris Levinson was born in 1872 in Latvia to Isaac and Hannah Levinson. The family, possibly because of persecution, moved between Latvia and Germany before immigrating to the U.S. and settling in Bay City, Michigan in 1888. Why Bay City? At that time, it was a lumber town undergoing a boom, which led to great opportunities for merchants. Isaac is listed in the directories for Bay City as a confectioner in the decades following. Everyone, even folks in the lumber industry in the late 1800s, needs a sweet treat now and then. Augusta Gittel Fellhunder was born in 1872 to Mordecai and Bessie Fellhunder in Latvia. She immigrated to the United States alone in 1890, at the age of 14. She spoke no English, and the only person she knew in the States was an older brother, Malka, who was living in Detroit. We don't know why the rest of the family didn't come with her. Maybe they only had enough money to send their children one at a time. Or maybe there was commitments to extend a family or community that held her parents back. Either way, Gittel would never see her mother or father again. And at the same time that Gittel was arriving in Detroit, Morris was also coming into the city to work. Why was Detroit a destination for both of them? In the 1850s, a sizable Jewish community had developed in the city, centered around the Hastings Street area neighborhood, although it should be noted that the first Jewish individuals to settle in Detroit had arrived in the mid-1700s. The Jewish community was primarily composed of Jews from Germany and Central Europe, but they welcomed the new Eastern European newcomers. When given the choice, people will often choose to live around others who share their cultural identity and values. Familiar sights, sounds, smells, and tastes are an important part of making a place feel like home. For recent Jewish immigrants, moving to an established community where they could easily procure kosher foods, find congregations to worship in, and be around folks who, while they might not have spoken the same language, had familiar upbringings and ways of going about their lives, might have helped them settle into their new home much faster. Morris and Gittel met soon after, and love was in the air. Morris and Gittel married in 1893 and their wedding portrait is part of the museum's collection and will be up on our website. The link will be in the show notes. We are not sure what Malka and Gittel did for work, 
but Morris was a peddler, a popular occupation for Jewish immigrants. Unlike opening a store, which depended on either buying land or renting a building, hiring staff, procuring signage, getting reliable stock, etc., etc., peddling had a fairly low startup cost. All you needed was the purchase or rent of a horse and cart, and a few goods to get started. Many peddlers, Morris included, would stay overnight in the house of their customers while on the road. We talked before about the business landscape of Birmingham, and check out our previous episode on E.A. O'Neill for a look at Birmingham's business landscape in the 1880s and 1890s. And we talked about how Birmingham was the commercial center between Pontiac and Detroit, conveniently located on the Maid Road through Oakland County, Saginaw Street, now Woodward Avenue, and on the railroad. But what if you lived in the parts of Oakland County that weren't along the railroad, or a major road? Sure, you could wait until the next time you had the opportunity to journey a few hours to a place like Birmingham, but as humans have always liked convenience and having things right now. And peddlers were kind of the Amazon Prime of their day. They would come to your village or settlement or home every week or so with an assortment of everyday essentials like sewing supplies, medicines, spices, kitchen utensils, linens, etc. At the time, local peddlers and their customers often formed close bonds. In an isolated community, the peddler might bring local gossip, special orders for customers, and provide a vital link to the wider world. But peddlers could also be found in towns and cities as well, because sometimes you just don't want to leave your house to shop. Morris Levinson was young, bright, and likable, and he knew how to make the best of new opportunities and new markets. The country farms around Birmingham welcomed him, and so did local merchants. In a 1926 article written to commemorate his career, Morris recalled that Alex Purdy was one of the Birmingham residents to encourage him to settle in Birmingham and open up a business. Morris recalled that he had some difficulty getting a storefront. Some believed that his store wouldn't be in business for more than three months. But in 1896, he opened his first economy store on the south side of Maple, just east of Woodward. Morris became involved in the Birmingham chapter of the Masons for his whole career in the village. Fraternal organizations were the main way to keep in contact with other merchants in the area and to give back to the community. The Levinsons were just one of the early Jewish families to settle in Oakland County in the 1890s. And the big reason for that was the DUR, or Detroit United Railroad, sometimes referred to as the interurban. This was the electric trolley cars that connected the Jewish community in Detroit with places like Pontiac and Birmingham. In the 1890s, trains between Birmingham and Detroit left about every hour, and it only cost 15 cents for a one-way ride to Detroit. This made it fairly easy and inexpensive for a Jewish family to visit merchants in Detroit that specialized in kosher foods, to attend religious services, and to keep in contact with other members of their community. Morris would get on the DUR once a week and head into Detroit for the week's shopping. The building that housed the Levinson's Economy Store had structural problems, and in 1898, Morris moved to a new building built on the northeast corner of Woodward and Maple, and the store remained there until it moved to Maple and South Old Woodward in 1916, where the Starbucks is today. In 1905, the store had five different stores within it, and it became Levinson's Department Store. The first department stores, or a single retail establishment divided into smaller departments, which each sold its own category of goods, began in the early 1800s in Europe and hit American shores in the mid-1800s with the establishment of department stores in New York and Chicago. These stores radically changed how Americans would shop for the next century and beyond. Before the department store, a shopper would have to go to many stores to get everything they needed. Flour would be at the dry goods store. For a new hat, you'd have to go to a milliner. For new shoes for the kids, you'd have to find a shoe store or a cobbler, etc., etc. It took a lot of time, 
And not to mention that often, before car culture became a part of American life, a lot of walking and being out in the elements. The department store offered convenience for the American shopper who had more discretionary income than ever. Everything you needed, and a lot of stuff that you didn't, was enticingly displayed. For women especially, they were increasingly using shopping as a recreational and social experience, and the department store became a destination. So you could save time, get a wider variety of goods, and have a place to meet up with others? It was truly revolutionary. But a department store could really only work in a larger community that had many shoppers. Luckily, Birmingham was becoming that sort of community. In the 1890s, there were about a thousand residents in the village, but many more people passed through every day, coming into Birmingham to bring their goods to the railroad, to shop, to go to school, to go to church, to visit, etc. A son of Morris and Giddle would say that they sold everything from groceries to furniture. And just as we saw in the case of E.A. O'Neill, the demand for luxury and high-end goods in Birmingham would rise throughout the 1900s. Ads that ran in yearbooks and newspapers in Birmingham in the 1920s and 30s would advertise everything from ready-to-wear clothing furniture, gifts, and candy. Maybe Morris learned a little bit of confectionery skill from his dad. In a 1954 article in the Birmingham Eccentric, which looked back on earlier days in the village, we get a humorous story about advertising gone wrong. Morris had paid a Birmingham resident to dress up as Santa Claus and walk around the village with a sign advertising Levinson's department store. Unbeknownst to both him and our Santa, somebody had pinned an advertisement for a rival store on Santa's back, and it took two hours before Morris spotted the prank. And just like how the retail environment in Birmingham was expanded in the 1890s, so too was the Levinson family. Aaron was born to Morris and Gittle in 1894, David in 1896, Bess in 1898, and Hyman in 1900. Bess was born at home, and the Levinson family likes to claim that she was the first and last Jewish family born in Birmingham. And it very well may be true. After that period, the majority of children were born in hospitals, and there are no hospitals within the Birmingham city limits. The Levinson kids grew up in Birmingham, but the family seems to have retained their connections to Detroit. Two of the Levinson kids went to high school in Detroit, rather than Birmingham High, and the family eventually relocated to Detroit in 1920. Although Morris continued running the store in Birmingham until 1926, and the store itself would continue until 1938. David Levinson remained in Birmingham and graduated from Birmingham High in 1913 with a class of less than 20 students. He also bucked another trend. He married outside of the faith. He and Martha Nye were high school sweethearts. Martha was just one year behind David. But there was one problem. Martha was a Christian. Giddle was initially vehemently opposed to the Union, but in the tradition of grandmas everywhere, eventually came around when David and Martha's son, Bernard, was born in 1927. David and Martha, with their son, continued to live in Birmingham. Giddle and Morris's oldest son, Aaron, became a lawyer, and High owned the Farmington Enterprise newspaper and was a radio pioneer. Giddle and Morris's only daughter, Bess, graduated from Birmingham High in 1914 and continued the tradition set by her three brothers by attending the University of Michigan. And this was a period of time when going on to pursue a college education wasn't super common, and it was even more uncommon for a woman to go on to college. She taught English to international students and got involved in the Metropolitan Detroit chapter of Hadassah, a Jewish women's organization founded in 1917, which sought to provide health care to people living in what was then Palestine. Bess also did something that I think is super smart if you live in a time period where you are expected to take your husband's last name upon marriage. 
Bess found a man with a name very, very close to hers. In this case, the man's name was Saul Levin. He was another community-minded individual and an attorney. So, all she had to do was shave the son part of her last name off. Which probably saved her a few milliseconds every time she had to spell her name, so both easy and efficient. And if you are from the Metro Detroit area and or politically aware, the name Levin might be ringing some bells. Bess and Saul had three children, Hannah, Sander, and Carl. All three got involved in state and national politics. Hannah worked for Michigan Governor James Blanchard and was appointed to the Social Justice Committee in Lansing by the Governors Blanchard and Engler. Carl served in the U.S. Senate from 1979 to 2014, and Sander served in the U.S. Congress from 1983 to 2018. The name Levinson can still be seen around Birmingham today. The Levinson Realty Company is currently operated by David and Martha Levinson's grandson, David, and the family still owns the Corton Building in downtown Birmingham. The next time you are downtown and need a pick-me-up, stop by the Starbucks at the corner of Maple and Old Woodward and take a look at the building and try to imagine the excitement of walking into a department store for the first time and having everything you need or could ever dream of needing right in front of you under one roof. Today, we take that for granted. After all, who amongst us has not run into a Target or Walmart and grabbed some underwear, roofing nails, iced coffee, and chapstick all in one trip? But in the 1890s, it was a truly transformative experience. Not just for the retail environment in Birmingham or nationally, but also in how people would live their lives for the next century or more. In the 1950s, another department store would move into the niche left behind when Levinson's closed and change Birmingham forever. But that's a story for our next podcast episode. Today, in downtown Birmingham, the pendulum has swung away from big department stores and has gone back to smaller local retailers specializing in one area category. It's sort of an inverse of someone in the 1880s, used to shopping in several specialized stores, going into a big department store for the first time. Folks today are so used to shopping in big department stores that we crave a smaller, more boutique experience. Everything old eventually becomes new, and time is just a timey-wimey, jeremy Bearmy sort of thing anyways. Join us next time for another story from the development of Birmingham's retail scene, as we look at Jacobson's department store and the man responsible for Birmingham's parking decks. For a full transcript of this episode and to see photos and other documents relating to Levinson's department store and the family, check out our website. The link is in the show notes. For questions, comments, or episode suggestions, please feel free to reach out to us at museum at bhamgov.org. For more information on the Birmingham Shopping District and to see their upcoming events, check out their website, allinbirmingham.com. The link will be in our show notes. I'm Caitlin Donnelly, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Birmingham Uncovered. Special thanks to the Birmingham Area Cable Board for Peg Grant funding that made this podcast possible. Also, thanks to past and present staff of the Birmingham Museum and our amazing volunteers. <laughs>